I'm Lorraine Ballard Morrow. We are celebrating WDAS's 70th birthday. And what we're doing is we're speaking to a lot of people who meant a lot to the history of WDAS. And today we speak to someone who truly understands and knows and can speak on the history of WDAS. And that's Wynne Alexander. Wynne is an American author, investigative journalist, documentary filmmaker, and also the curator of WDAS uh, A History a website, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But first of all, thank you so much for taking the time with us, Wynne. It's great. Great to see you, Lorraine. When you uh, have deep roots at WDAS, not only did you work there, but your grandfather, Max Leon, owned WDAS AM and FM, and your dad, Bob Klein, was general manager of the stations. And also, you started out as a teenager, right, working in the news department. How did you get to, uh, to start working in the news department? What was that like? I was uh, very fortunate. My grandfather saw a piece that I, a very early video piece that I did on uh, actually the study of opera. And he decided that uh, in addition to my musical skills and theater writing, that I was a journalist. And so they put me on the air. I wasn't yet 19. What was wonderful about my exposure to that newsroom, not only as a a working journalist, but I can say I knew Joe Rainey. I knew Jim Clash. Joe Rainey, uh, Jim Clash, one of the most decorated, award-winning journalists in our region, probably in the country. Joe Rainey was an extraordinary visionary. He had one of the first African-American talk shows in the nation. And most importantly, or of paramount importance, his knowing how important Malcolm X was. Joe Rainey's relationship with Malcolm X created WDAS's relationship with Malcolm X. And what a lot of people don't realize now that Malcolm has become an acknowledged hero was that in Malcolm's lifetime, especially near his death, his assassination. He was held in very low esteem by almost everyone. Yes. He did not have friends in the black community at all. There was a, a divide and he was seen, they believed the hype, white and black folks believed the hype about Malcolm and then his own natural constituency turned on him and Wait, were responsible. Okay. Let's talk about that for a second because um, we're going to skip around clearly, but uh, let's talk about Malcolm X because Joe Rainey did probably one of the key interviews. I mean, this was a time when you could actually talk to somebody on the radio for two hours, right? Back in the day instead of yeah. these 30 second sound bites. So he, he interviewed Malcolm X. Malcolm X at that time actually had death threats, correct? Absolutely. Um, I've done a great deal of research into this, seminal research, um, because I was so intrigued by it. I, and I'm sad to say I wasn't intrigued until, well, I was only a little, I was a kid when Joe was there. I wish things had been just a little later in the timeline. The three days, in which I hold expertise and where I've been on other shows and speaking with other authors on this subject, those three days are crucial. Um, the fact is that Philadelphia and WDAS protected Malcolm and saw to saving his life. There were the, the night of that last broadcast, which was late in December, there were death threats. We had 100 plainclothesmen, uniformed, cops brandishing shotguns lining the walkway where Malcolm came in. I believe they did a, a decoy situation because his guys were beaten up and accosted at the Sheraton Hotel. But, but Malcolm was walking with a different bodyguard uh, that night. And so he sailed into the station without incident. And the, the lobby, the halls were crowded with all kinds of police, 
agents. There were sharpshooters on the roof. Wow. There were, uh, the, depending on which uh, newspaper report of the time, 14 to 16 dogs and canine uh, unit members had been in the woods, combing the, the woods and, and portions of Fairmount Park. We were able in Philadelphia to protect him. Yes. What therefore happened in New York only six weeks later? Exactly, because he was assassinated at the Audubon Ballroom six weeks after he was protected and appeared at WDAS. I'm going to pause on that for just a second and just talk about um, and ask you to, to put into context the importance of WDAS in the civil rights movement. Um, because back in the day, uh, there was not a lot of outlets for news of relevance to people of color, to the African-American community at the time. You couldn't just rip and read right from AP because that information was not relevant to the listeners at WDAS. So there was a large newsroom and it was a, a, a vibrant newsroom that got news and information off the streets and on the airwaves for that community. In the, in the early 1950s, the general manager, Bob Klein, did a survey of who the African-American leaders were because no one knew. If you're not highlighted, then how do we know about you? We don't. So in 1952, 55, this was seminal basic beginning work. You mentioned the wire services. Not only could we not rip and read, I have in my collection my Associated Press and my UPI bylines. There were four reporters feeding the wire services black news in those days. Uh, three of them were from WDAS. And uh, the, the, the wire services at least admitted finally they didn't know. Now that was already the 70s. Clearly, there would have been a mystery in the 50s. One of the th because WDAS has so many firsts in terms of music, broadcasting innovations, Hall of Fame uh, disc jockeys, we, we do not get the credit that we should get for creating one of the first, if not the first, it's hard to research that. We were one of the first and certainly probably the largest working newsroom devoted to the coverage of human rights, civil rights, investigative journalism in terms of, is this country fulfilling its promise in 1955? Uh, 1951, the first uh, black show goes on the air with Randy Record Mixon Dixon. That's three years prior to Brown versus the Board of Education. And when Little Rock hit, we sent a reporter to Little Rock which meant we sent about 50% of the news staff because at that time there were only two. But when Art Peters came back, WDAS arranged, Little Rock was so upsetting to people. They wanted to hear more. And, and that was the desegregation of, of schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. Right. And where Eisenhower had to call out the troops right. to protect the black students. And when you see those films, it's kind of heartbreaking. Well, that heart ache, DAS arranged for Art Peters to tour any community group or church that wanted to do a Q&A with him to, to understand and in that way have more information, information is power, and so to feel better about what all was going on in Little Rock, Arkansas. So here he does this yeoman's task by getting that the minute he gets back, he's going all around the, the, uh, the area, anywhere, tri-state area, to tell people what he saw, what he experienced, and to take heart. WDAS was really the go-to place for black leaders to come to in the civil rights movement. And we talked about Malcolm X, but Martin Luther King, that was a, a stop that he never skipped when he was in Philadelphia, was to be on WDAS. Yeah. The uh, picture behind me 
uh, is a picture of uh, Dr. King. Ralph Abernathy is there. And uh, Bob Klein is uh, shaking Dr. King's hand. Uh, and Cecil Moore is in the picture kind of looking away. Uh, Cecil is a little bit betraying uh, in his body language. Um, there was some, there, there was some stress and tension between the two. <laughs> well, the whole reason for the uh, for the event, uh, which was one of a series of events, um, Bob Klein negotiated a peace treaty with Cecil Moore so he would stop attacking Dr. King. Um, sad, but so. But it's 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 all documented. We even recently found uh, footage of a press conference. Uh, DAS stage helped stage a press conference at the Bellevue Stratford where Dr. King appeared with Cecil on the stage together. Mm -hmm. And even there, if you watch just for Cecil, it's, um, it, it's a very telling piece of historic footage. And uh, later that evening, uh, uh, there was a three-day period, actually. There was a parade down Broad Street. There was also a, a very big dinner uh, for Dr. King, uh, I believe, at the Warwick Hotel. And, and we, have, we have those pictures as well. Um, and then there was a court, you know, between the NAACP, which is what Cecil headed locally, and Dr. King is the national leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, ESCLC. Well, uh, back to the key importance of WDAS. Um, on the website that you curate, there's something from the Reverend Andrew Young, who, for those who don't know, some of the younger folks, uh, he was one of Dr. King's most trusted confidants. He was uh, involved with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, co-drafter of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He was a congressman, mayor of Atlanta, U.S. ambassador. And he said, and I quote, to our knowledge, there is no station in America that's worked harder, longer, and with more dedication for black people than WDAS in Philadelphia. What an acknowledgement that was. Um, that it's huge. And um, because by that point in the 60s, I believe that letter is from 1969, if I'm not mistaken. Um, by that point, there were other black radio stations who had come into prominence and ascendance. And there were lots of people trying to say they were there when, you know, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes people exaggerate what they did. So to have that from Andrew Young is number one, extraordinary, but it also indicates the extraordinary work that WDAS was doing in partnership with SCLC. Also Roy Wilkins of the National NAACP, WDAS was not a local radio station. When you listen to our news, and when you, when you understand the impact that we had on the music industry, we were a national station that just happened to be located in Philadelphia. Our impact in subject after subject after subject was national, and that's unusual. You know, um, in addition to the role that DAS had in providing information and news that you really couldn't get anywhere else and being such a leader in supporting the reporters and anchors and jocks who uh, brought that information to the air, your family was very instrumental in the background, right, of, of the civil rights movement to help with raising funds and, and being really a supporter for those individuals who are working so hard for civil rights back in the day? One of the big innovations that Bob Klein came up with were the WDAS charity show. And in those days, you could really get the talent who really loved DAS themselves, even if they were the temptations from Detroit, as Jimmy Bishop used to say, my five other brothers, you could really get them to come in for the cause. And as long as you got them a great hotel room, they would perform that night for free. And so you had these wild lineups of, instead of one A act, a B act, and a C and an opener, 
you had five A acts and five tremendous up and coming artists and another three openers, just a, a cavalcade of gorgeous entertainment. And the community would know who that night's performances, which organizations were going to be the beneficiaries of the money that came in. The amount of fundraising that uh, Bob and Max Leon did uh, for the community. Uh, again, they, they kept it quiet. They wanted the station and the jocks and the news people to get the credit. Uh, but clearly, the, everything was being organized uh, by, by Bob and with the great blessing and also the diplomacy of Max Leon. Uh, Max could, could pull a rabbit out of a hat at very high levels uh, when you needed uh, that kind of uh, magic. I wonder if you can share some memories that you have of working at WDAS in the news department or just being there in the presence during the time that you were there. What are some, some stories you can tell us, some memories that really stand out in your mind? Well, Go, going back to Joe Rainey, um, when I was very, very little, uh, typewriters held great fascination. And I'm very, I don't know what those are, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. they were, so yeah, like a mechanical typewriter. And in the newsroom, they had special ones. Sometimes the fonts were bigger. And um, so the secretaries could only hold you on their lap a little bit because they had to, you know, make sure the station stayed on the air. But then I discovered the newsroom and they always had a spare typewriter. And to his great credit, Joe Rainey was so patient. And I mean, here's this trailblazer of journalism, this trailblazer in terms of who were guests on his shows. By the way, I have a couple of the, the, the Malcolm X shows. One of them, he staged a debate between Malcolm X and two Baptist ministers and Joe laid back. He only did the station breaks at the top and bottom of the hour. It was, wow. it's, a, it's amazing uh, when you hear that one. And here is Joe Rainey making sure that I'm in my little chair and he would put the paper in the typewriter for me and he would give me an assignment. I don't even know how to read or, you know, I, I barely know how to read. I certainly don't know how to type. I'm about five years old and he gives me an assignment for the day. And I'm to time to write because he's at his typewriter writing and I'm, I'm writing with him. And I will never forget that. Uh, John Bandy um, was an enormous talent, towering talent. Uh, he was both an amazing disc jockey and he also was in the newsroom. And um, there were a number of uh, uh, experiences, shall we call them, uh, with John. Uh, in the newsroom and uh, that involved Jim Clash. Um, it, it's odd. On the other hand, I mean, once I found out what WDAS AM was, like I didn't know. Uh, in those days, the FM was playing jazz and classical music. And my mother tended to listen to that. We had another fabulous disc jockey. Uh, speaking of uh, Sonia Leon, um, one of her favorite DJs of all time, in addition to Wayne Joel, another guy who doesn't get enough mention because there's so many stars that came out of FM, Sir Lancelot, um, George Johnson Jr. had this gorgeous jazz show. Um, so the richness of music, the guests, the uh, one, one day I was lamenting, I was going through the archives. And I kept finding a picture of Jackie Robinson or a picture of Malcolm, but where was the sound? We were a radio station. Well, white stations made a lot more money than black stations. It's probably two thirds more money in the 50s. And that remained. That's why WDAS had to sue Arbitron because we weren't even getting our ratings. And if you don't have the ratings, then nobody believes you have the listeners. If you don't have that, you don't have the advertising revenues to keep your lights on. And it's ironic because at different times in the history, DAS AM was the number one radio station. It was huge. 
it was huge. And we were punching way over our weight in terms of our transmitter power. We were rivaling the two big guys, which were WFIL and WIBG. At that point, IP had fallen, fallen by the wayside. Their, uh, their listenership had gotten older and less relevant, and, and they had gotten uh, less relevant. Uh, we were always punching above our weight. And the contributions even to how listenership is counted, WDAS again plays a, a national groundbreaking role because we did a class action suit in 19, it was settled in 71 on behalf of all black radio saying ARB, Arbitron was not counting our listeners and they weren't. So that, that's, that's the kind of trouble we were up against. Yeah. It was institutional, it was institutional racism. There's no other way to put it. Now you have been a curator of WDAS history and you have created this really kind of amazing website and it's for anybody who loves DAS, I think that it's definitely, you have to check it out. It's WDASHistory.org. Um, what, uh, what inspired you to put that together? And, and how did you round up all the archival uh, and very precious pictures and articles and all of that? Well, let, let me say the uh, actual inspiration, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Um, in one week, I heard three different people who some people respected, tell three different lies about WDAS. And I'd had it. I grew up with that. I grew up, people were always very comfortable talking in front of me. And they apparently, uh, I heard a lot. But in that particular week, it was around 2007, I had heard enough. By the way, all of the writing uh, on, on the website is also researched and written. Uh, by me. And um, that week, I just had had it. My brother has my father's collection of photos. So what I had, now, by the way, I had already worked on, in, in 2000, uh, Butterball uh, contacted me, and I uh, co-produced a film for the 50th anniversary. And so I, I had been through the pictures with a fine tooth comb at that time and had already done some writing. Here it is 2007 and I was, uh, I said, good. I went, literally, I went and got the script, went and looked, re looked at the pictures and decided if you go back in time, uh, the first two people that were mentioned on that website were Joe Rainey, and Malcolm and Jim Clash. Mm. Those were the first two DAS stars and that amazing presence that is Malcolm X. Those are the three people that I wrote about. And it, you, as you're looking at the thing now, it just blossomed from there. I still have not begun to do justice to WDAS FM. We actually have a lot of bragging points there. We were also the first progressive station or hippie station on the East Coast. There were only two in the country. There was the West Coast, San Fran, uh, the Pioneer. Uh, this is where you would hear uh, Buffalo Springfield, Buffy St. Marie, uh, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Sly, and the Family Stone. The uh, AF wasn't always uh, R&B. It was, it was that underground rock station exactly yeah underground rock absolutely progressive radio i think some of the das uh, literature actually called it and yeah that lasted about i'm going to say two years roughly bob klein never understood that as well he said that to me in in a couple of ways and somewhat directly so when the opportunity came we kept a lot of the white acts from that library and we just made our focus rhythm and blues r&b album oriented 
music. And by the way, it was predicted that it would be a failure. He put Harvey Holiday in charge of it. Music for the people, a fabulous tagline. Mm. Uh, that was our uh, audio logo for years. And we had, that to me was one of the most gorgeous uh, formats because it was so diverse. In addition to B.B. King, followed by Carol King, followed by Sly, followed by the Sweet Inspirations. Um, you also would, in the middle of something here, Nikki Giovanni doing poetry. And then, you know, up underneath would, would come Buddy Miles, you know, or I, it was just a phenomenally sounding station, phenomenal. Well, that kind of brings me to um, the way that the news was conveyed, because it wasn't necessarily always just straight news, per se, that sometimes music was incorporated into, you know, the kind of underlying some of the themes of what, what was being conveyed. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean, you'll tell me. But for instance, um, so one of the programs that I hosted was called Assignment Reporter. And it was supposed to be taped, it was one hour. And it was an in-depth look at the most important stories of that week. And one day uh, I didn't do the tape. So I ran in to do the show live. And my phone's lit up at six o'clock in the morning. On a Sunday morning. I did not know. Before <laughs> listening. <laughs> well, yeah, because if, if people are actually making the effort to make that call, mm -hmm. they represent far more than the calls that you're getting. Absolutely. Uh, same with letters, as you know, Lorraine, mm -hmm. in the biz. So uh, I went, oh, my God. So at that point, I began doing the show live. And, yeah, I would play, for instance, the opener was Stevie Wonder's Pastime Paradise. Because that, just the title says so much. And it was also a very sophisticated song. And yet it was also so appealing. Um, and there would be drop-ins as I would maybe go from one news story to another. And also what I began to do was open up the phones so that people could talk about the week's news events. So you had all levels of what radio could bring. Uh, information, music, and then communication about both. Exactly. So that the music that you played while you were doing the show kind of underscored some of the ideas that you were conveying uh, in your program. Yeah, one of the most famous examples of this, um, I actually put this in my civil rights book. We played a lot of Ray Charles, America the Beautiful, because of the poignant irony. If, if we're hearing that on WDAS FM, it's being heard by, as I used to put it, the coolest people in three to four states because we had listeners in Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, portions of, of Maryland, but you're also going out over the landscape. What is the landscape? Sure, it's some gorgeous verdant parks, beautiful homes, high rises, but it was also troubled neighborhoods that didn't get the funding for their schools that perhaps just across city line they were getting in Lower Marion for their schools. And so, America the beautiful, oh beautiful for spacious skies. There was a poignant irony, a crushing irony that we were also pointing up. Yes, let's make all of America beautiful. Mm. So to conclude, what would you like to say about the importance of this radio station? What would be your your final word, your evaluation of the importance of, of the station in the fabric of Philadelphia and the fabric of this country? WDAS Radio, AM and FM, was an extraordinary, hard-fought miracle. At the time that WDAS was challenging 
the power structure, you could get harmed. People got killed. We had a spate of assassinations yeah. that Dr. King was part of, that Malcolm was part of, that Viola Liuzzo was part of, that Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman were part of. Mm. We were allied with them. We were empowered, that entire movement. There were bomb threats at WDAS, at times numerous, in clusters. This was a, this was a war. And we were winning. And then when you're winning, there's backlash. So it, it, it was a crescendo starting in the early 50s, Little Rock, to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, to the Housing Act, the Voting Rights Act, all in the mid 60s. Dr. King himself spoke about the dangers of the backlash when you're too powerful or perceived as such, and all you're doing is trying to be equal. Nobody wanted to be, we, we were just trying to, to be equal. And that can be misinterpreted. We see it today with the current presidency and his constituency. Progress will always win. But at WDAS, we had a tremendous ability to identify and care about having the country become its best self. What was written in the papers of the 1700s so that everyone could be equal together. And we, we put everything on the line to make that happen. And I think that's why to this day there is such love. There's a different kind of love for WDAS than other TV stations or radio stations. And I think it's because of that tremendous commitment that uh, Max and Bob set into motion. And by the way, it's a commitment that for those of us who are exposed to it, we carry it every day and we try to make more good happen. I think uh, that was beautifully said. Wynn Alexander, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Wynn Alexander, author, investigative journalist, documentary filmmaker, the uh, curator of a wonderful website, which is WDASHistory.org. And if you want more information in depth about, uh, about the history of DAS, you should check it out. And you have a website as well that's uh, not only about your background in, at DAS, but about all the other things that you do. And what is that website? Uh, you could do winalexandermedia.com. Wonderful. Win Alexander, thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing your thoughts and your memories about WDAS as we celebrate 70 years, 70 years, seven decades in Philadelphia is one of the seminal African-American owned stations, African-American targeted stations in, in the country. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm Lorraine Ballard-Morrow.